Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense, common knowledge, or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do, but only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Quick note before we begin, the Finding Genius Foundation, as part of the Finding Genius Podcast, has recently completed a book about understanding viruses. So the creation of this book was to interview a 100 virologists, ask them a lot of deep, difficult questions, take the most difficult questions, and then re-interview the top 25 or so and ask them the hardest questions I could think of. And we compiled that all into a book. So you'll see question and four or five experts' answers. Question, four or five experts' answers. There's about 30 questions in the book. I think it's a great read for the layperson and for the researcher. It talks about a lot of speculation in the world of viruses, such as are they alive or not? And why is it important? Uh, why do viruses go latent or hidden or ineffective or sit in a person or an animal or another creature for weeks, months, years, and then suddenly become virulent and affect that person? Uh, so there's a lot of really provocative questions in the book. It's now on Amazon. So if you go to Amazon and type in Finding Genius, you'll see the book on viruses. It's also on Kindle. The Audible version is in production and should be ready in approximately a month. But if you want to go and order it now, uh, you can do so, again, by going to Amazon or Kindle or go, go to FindingGeniusFoundation.org and go to Publications. There's an opportunity as well to get the transcripts of all the interviews and to hear the original interviews themselves. If we had put them all together, the book would be about a 1,000 pages, but we condensed them down to make it juicy and concise and tight and very interesting. So I hope you'll check out the book. Uh, we're now working on one about cancer, but this is going to be our goal is uh, three times a year to come out with these masterclass books that I think will inspire new scientific research, and I hope you'll check it out. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have a returning guest, Christos Chinopoulos. He's at Semmelweis University. He's an associate professor. He's also a project manager of uh, the RPPA facility, and we're going to talk about uh, the questions I have for my cancer book, of which he's going to be a part. So, Christos, thanks for coming back. Nice to be here. Well, tell me, uh, first question, do you believe cancer is a separate life form within our body, or do you think it's, it's just part of our cells, but it doesn't really have its own identity or agency or you know, coordinated action? Well, it would depend uh, on the purpose why you are asking this question. So if you would like to understand it philosophically or you would like to do something about it, uh, if you would like to do something about it, for example, to eliminate it out of the body, then you have to consider it rather as an entity uh, because it uh, exhibits very many different characteristics on very basic levels, for example, metabolic or immunological. So, so from, this, from this aspect, it can be seen as an own entity. Yeah, I ask because I believe if it's its own entity, it wants to protect itself and the cells that make it up work together to achieve its goals. You know, for instance, a, a primary tumor, is it a separate living thing at the stage where it's a few cells or only when it gets to a million or a billion? And if you have a, a you know a tumor burdened with a primary tumor and various metastases, do they all work together as one? Or are they competing and are they separate? That's why I ask. It may be so at the beginning when you have just a few cells proliferating. But if you think of it, the ultimate goal is the killing of the subject. And that does not serve the, the, the purpose of the tumor because uh, the vast majority of tumors are not infectious. So if the subject dies, then the tumor dies with it. So then why would it go into the trouble of doing what it's doing? That's, that's, that's a big unknown. And, and it's, a, it's a, bit, a little bit... Uh, it's a bit more complicated than that to uh, elaborate in one or two sentences if the tumor is an entity on itself from the beginning and from the end, because it serves different purposes depending at which stage is it. Is it a few cells, a lot of cells, metastasize, and so on. What percentage of cancers don't metastasize versus do? Well, by definition, uh, cancers can be benign or malignant, and uh, the difference is that benign cancers do not uh, metastasize, but they actually should be called benign tumors. And one of the characteristics, apart except from lack of metastasis, is that they are well encapsulated. 
and uh, they exhibit uh, uh, contact inhibition. But those cancers that metastasize, they have very hazy borders and they some the majority of them have the tendency to metastasize. The stimulus for metastasis is not known for most of the cases. Of the benign tumors, do they occur in the same organs that cancerous tumors occur in or do yes, they only okay. occur in a subset? No, no, no. But there can be benign tumors in practically every tissue in the human body. So what's the difference between a, you know, like a neoplasm or a benign tumor and a cancerous one, if you look at it from a pathological you know, or histological okay. standpoint? Okay, neoplasm can be both benign, benign or metastatic. If it is benign, it's going to be well encapsulated. If you are able to culture it uh, outside the body, then it will show the process of contact inhibition. It means that if you put several cells next to each other, when they start touching, they, they don't really uh, proliferate even further. Unlike the metastatic cells, that they will just proliferate on each other. They make many layers and so on. And they lack in, the metastatic cells, they lack encapsulation. So they, if you are to see, for example, in the body or even in a radiological image, the tumor is not well delineated. It's, it's, the borders are not, are not known. And this is actually one of the major problems with uh, rejecting a metastatic tumor because you don't really know what, what is the tumor and what is the human material. That's why in the vast majority of cases, you have to take out the whole organ which can be possible in some cases, if it's, for example, a breast cancer, but it's not possible in other organs, like if it is a brain tumor. And, uh, so, uh, and uh, yeah, another, another main difference is, of course, that the benign tumors, they, they never metastasize, unlike the, the malignant tumors that uh, many of them metastasize to, to different organs. And they also have uh, organ predilection. So, for example, lung to brain or liver to lung, there are, there are some very well-known uh, predilection pathways for metastasis. So, okay. So non-cancerous tumors have a, a very defined border. What is the border constituted of? Is it cell walls that thicken on the outside, or like what is it um, fibrotic tissue that surrounds the tumor? You well, know, it, can be many. It, it can be many. For example, as you mentioned, fibrotic tissue, a, a benign, a very well uh, understood benign tumor is a so-called meningioma in the brain. It is uh, very well encapsulated. It is mostly a, a fibrous tissue composed of uh, the meninges. And it is really well encapsulated. You take it out, it's like a perfect ball. But other tissues, uh, they, they can be encapsulated and they form um, a mesh of reticular, reticulin fibers. For ex some organs, for example, the liver, it contains um, it, a very well structure of cells. And the structure is kept uh, in order through reticulin fibers. Now, when you have a mass being produced there, if it is benign, it will be encapsulated. And in many cases, the encapsulation will be part of the normal tissue. In other cases, the encapsulation can be part of the tumor uh, healthy tissue interface, which is called the stroma. And sometimes this can be visible, sometimes it's not visible. And in other very fast growing tumors, you have those that uh, you have the blood vessels entering into the tumor and around the tumor, they make a network, a blood vascular network. And this can, this can actually form the encapsulation. These are just a few examples of what I'm mentioning. That the, the means of encapsulation of a tumor can be actually very many. Yeah, it's, it's, that's amazing. I didn't know this. What, uh, if you resect a, a benign tumor, uh, does it ever come back? What's the you know, reoccurrence rate versus regular tumors? It depends on the tumor. Some, some they do. For example, um, a lipoma. M many of us have a lipoma. If you take out a lipoma and it's very well encapsulated, sometimes it comes again. Uh, this is, and this is a very good example demonstrating that uh, tumor cells uh, are not necessarily within the tumor. They can be elsewhere in the vicinity of the, where the tumor was and they come again. Uh, on the other hand, you have tumors that if you take them out, they never come back again. For example, like a, like a meningioma, it, it never comes again. Do they come again less often than cancerous tumors or has anyone studied that? You know, it's very well studied. So uh, about 50% of the, of the tumors are, are benign. And of course you have, in some cases, you have transition from benign to malignant, but 50% of all tumors, world population is, are benign. Oh, you said about 50% of all tumors are benign? Yeah. Okay. And you mentioned they have a predilection, you call it, for certain organs when they metastasize. Yes. Or I guess you can call it a tropism. Why do you think cancers have tropisms? Before we continue, 
I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now, back to the show. I, I don't know, but what I can tell you is that it's a very hot topic of research. It's not in my, within my expertise, but it relates to the um, extracellular matrix found in the metastasized tissue, and some cells like it. I mean, some metastasized... Well, I, I, I use the word uh, like uh, in lack of a better word. We do not really know what is the, uh, the affinity of the tumor cell to that particular extracellular matrix, but it is uh, very well known that some tumors preferentially metastasized to, metastasized to particular organs. And this predilection has been tracked in some specific proteins found in the extracellular matrix, acting as docking proteins for the metastatic cells to enter that tissue. What about uh, niche preparation for metastases? How does what, that happen? You know, what, what are the initial stages of, has anyone observed this, of a metastasis forming in, a, you know, in another tissue? If anyone has observed a observed metastasis happening in another tissue. Yeah, at a very early stage where there's just a few yeah. cells, let's say. Yes, 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 of course. And um, this is very actively pursued with the use of uh, fluorodeoxyglycose uh, positron emission tomography or fluoroglutamine positron emission tomography. Sometimes when the um, you have a primary tumor in which it is known to uh, form metastasis, and if you want to catch it very early, and because it is known that tumor cells, they take up glucose and glutamine avidly. So they, they give a fluoroderivative of glucose or glutamine to the patient and they uh, undergo a PET CT scan. And the PET CT scan will light up where the fluoroglucose or fluorodeoxy, fluoroglutamine is being taken up, which is just a bunch of metastatic cells. They can be a few thousands, which cannot really be seen, nor can they be discernible if you open up uh, the, the particular tissue, but they do show up in a PET scan. Do you know if anyone has done some, or if I if I did an experiment where I took a benign tumor and a cancerous tumor, same tissue type, and I did some single cell sequencing on both, what do you think the differences would be if I if I looked at both? That would be huge. Actually, you would, even if you do single cell sequencing within the same tumor, uh, if it is malignant, you would you would find uh, different uh, sequences for every cell inside the tumor. But has anyone identified what is it that allows, you know, a tumor to grow, but what differentiates it between it being benign and cancerous in, in so, any given case? Okay. So there are there are a list of genes. Well what I, I will tell you now what is the state of the art regarding uh, knowledge, but I'm I have to tell you up front that I, I don't really believe this approach. But this is what I have studied at least during medicine. There are a list of genes which are uh, baptized like oncogenes or proto-oncogenes. And uh, if one of those genes are overactivated, then this leads to um, a higher uh, likelihood for developing a metastatic or, or a cancer. But slowly, slowly, this has been found not to be the case because especially if you compare the transcriptome, that is the, the sequence of, of the genome, of normal adult tissue versus the transcriptome of tumorous tissue, these differences become much less blurred. So what we have been calling as oncogenes or proto-oncogenes, which are of course very important genes for normal proliferation of cells. And we tend to believe that if there is a mistake in this prolifer if this, uh, if this regulation of the genes, they lead to cancer, may actually not be the case. What is true for very few genes, for example, the P53 gene, this is called the um, guardian of the genome. The vast majority of uh, tumors, they lack or they have mutations on the P53 gene. And the P53 is very well known to check the genome for uh, mutations that may lead into abnormal growth. And oh, many tumors do have mutations in this gene and they allow uh, uncontrolled cell proliferation. This is well known. 
If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. But for other genes that they drive mutations, they're called driver mutations. I think uh, that uh, theory is, tends to lose traction, tends to lose steam. Okay. Do you know anyone that's tried to do a whole bunch of single cell sequencing from all over a tumor? Let's say it's a sphere. Has anyone tried to figure out the structure, even though it's heterogeneous, of a tumor? And then try yeah. to use software to back calculate how it originated yes. and how it grew yeah. from, yes. you know, from the beginning. Yeah, yeah. So this is this is extremely hot point of research right now. This is a so-called single cell transcriptomics, and to uh, understand the heterogeneity of the tumor cells within a tu- within a tumor mass. Such kind of research is happening as we speak. Uh, you need. Uh, uh, very highly specialized machinery and funding and uh, to do all that. But it, it does happen. It does happen. Now, of course, if it happens, you end up with a huge list of uh, genes activated in these cells versus other cells. The interpretation will take also an enormous amount of effort to understand and make a, draw some conclusions out of it. But yes, it is very actively pursued to have the so-called single cell transcriptomics of a tumor mass. Well, on how many different le- levels do you think heterogeneity occurs in a tumor? So, like, all the cells in a tumor uh, or would have you'd have a lot of groups that have different genes turned on and off. They would yes, all have but, different epigenetics. They would probably true, all true. have different localized microbiomes around each of the cells, I guess, because they'd show different surface antigens and stuff. Yes, like, how many different but, levels of heterogeneity do you think exists, and what are they? Okay, so the, the, this is an excellent question, but the answer should depend. Why do you want to know? Is it for you to understand it, uh, what is what is happening overall, or because you want to do something about it? Because if you want to do well, something, both. About it, both, okay. Yeah. So, so, well, I, if you want to understand it, then I think every cell will be different. <laughs> if you want to do something about it, then then uh, uh, I think it would be enough to identify a few layers, maybe three or four layers. The, uh, for example, those cells that uh, are the, 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 one, the highly proliferating ones, the, the, which are mostly glycolytic, they do not rely on oxidative phosphorylation, they are the ones that are the so-called clonal stem cells of tumors. Then you have something, some, some other cells which are, they don't have the omnipotency of the cancer cells, then you have some other ones that feed everybody, then you have the other ones that, for, that form the uh, capsule around the tumor, and, and you can have some other ones that they fulfill the so-called hallmarks of cancer, because so many cancers, they have um, different uh, uh, aspects in evading uh, immune detection and uh, sustaining proliferation. So I think this is a, these tasks are assigned in different cells within the tumor mass in an effort to preserve the main tumor and, uh, and make metastasis more and more likely. Yeah, what is, what is the structure of a tumor? Like you said, it'll have some kind of capsule. It'll have a, a central mass. Will it have like a stem cell core? You know, what are okay. some of the other substructures of it? Yeah, so so again, the structure shows heterogeneity, but the, what is uh, most people will come into agreement, especially for the solid tumors, because the blood cancers, they do not have any structure, of course. But the solid tumors, if it is a metastatic one and grows very fast, there's going to be a necrotic uh, center, or at least we think it's a necrotic center. Uh, and then there is a so-called penumbra region, which is, uh, which is around the necrotic center, and uh, it is uh, hypoperfused, but metabolically extremely active. And most of the cells uh, responsible for, for uh, clonality of the, of the cancers rely, uh, reside in this penumbra uh, area. And then you have the area outside the penumbra, which is layer of cells that consists of cells that uh, form the stroma, they they employ fibroblast on the near on the nearby normal tissue to feed uh, the cancer cells. Uh, you have those cells that will induce angiogenesis. Uh, you have those cells that uh, are uh, becoming immunologically blank, so therefore they are not going to be detected uh, by the host immune system, and so on. If I have cancer in a given organ, will the cancer start to resemble or recapitulate or look like the organ at all? Will it differentiate and make different structures that look like that organ or will it look just more like a jumble of, of junk? Uh, yes, it won't look like the organ, but one uh, trick that uh, tumor cells uh, have in their pocket is that they're becoming so-called immunologically blank. They do not show evidence of being foreign in that tissue. So even though it may not look like a liver tissue, 
but to the immune cells constantly circulating the body, it will look like a liver tissue or it will look like it's not there. So in terms of heterogeneity, if I have a, um, a tumor in my colon and there's tons of microbes in there, you know, they, there's a localized microbiome. And if a lot of the microbes, let's say, are, you know, they attach to certain cells because they trade metabolites with them. And if I have a tumor that's very heterogeneous, wouldn't that attract, I don't know, a whole bunch of different localized microbiomes around the tumor cells and, and therefore you get a very eclectic and probably competitive environment or maybe like a mess? Uh-huh. Um, okay. The uh, the concept of the microbiome with the tumor is a, a very new and a, a very interesting one. So, uh, and also the, tum- the concept of tumor microenvironment is a very, very important. But there is a special relation that I'd like to draw your attention regarding microbiome and, and, uh, and cancer. One is that, and that is that um, I believe that uh, if it, uh, in, an induction of inflammation could be the start of, a, of um, thwarting the, the cancer. Because one problem with the cancer is that the tumors are known to calm down the immunological response of the host. So, so immunologically speaking, you are the means of inducing or recognizing inflammation are, are dampened down. So if you have, for example, if someone has a, a liver tumor, it may be a good idea to start to infect the particular organ with a tissue-specific agent that will cause a local inflammation, and that may wake up the the immune cells of the host and uh, may be able to recognize the tumor better and get rid of it. You know, for instance, um, bacteria often form biofilms. Yes. So around a tumor, do you expect that biofilm production might be disrupted because there are so many competing Um, localized bacteria there? Yes, I'm not within my fields of expertise, but I wouldn't be surprised if that's the case. Okay. If we look at microenvironments, what's been noticed about the microenvironment of a tumor that makes it interesting or of metastases, a primary metastasis? Okay, so the tumor microenvironment uh, is um, an extremely interesting point of research and, and from from the academic point of view. One of them is the, the um, uh, very, ho- very high acidity of the tumor. In the past, it has been attributed to lactic acid production, but now we know that this is only partially true. It is also because of carbon dioxide production in the tumor and the local presence of carbonic anhydrase. And for reasons that we don't understand, the high acidity of the tumor microenvironment is very favorable for the tumor. And if it is to inhibit that, then you actually inhibit the ability of the tumor to metastasize and grow even further. And right now, there are actually clinical trials with carbonic anhydrase inhibitors exactly to do that, to prevent the acidification of the tumor microenvironment. The other interesting thing about the tumor microenvironment is that it coerces nearby healthy tissue to serve the needs of the tumor. So, for example, uh, many tumors, especially those that uh, divide very fast and they they have uh, insufficient blood supply for delivery of oxygen and nutrients, they coerce the nearby human uh, health tissue to sacrifice themselves for their metabolites. For example, those tumors that um, they require glutamine or serine or arginine and they cannot get it from the bloodstream, they will get it from the nearby human, uh, from nearby healthy tissue. The cancer cells, when it's at the beginning of the growing, will not start eating each other. This is a, this is a, a kind of a zombie behavior. You know, one zombie never eats the other zombie, but they eat only the healthy subjects. So the cancer cells, they will start eating those healthy cells, which are within the tumor microenvironment. And these are all regulated by the uh, pH and metabolite concentration of the tumor microenvironment. So when a cancer grows, does it grow from its own cancer cells that are dividing? Or does it turn into local healthy tissue? Does it turn local healthy tissue cells into cancer cells? The primary tumor... Okay, so what can happen is that normal cells can be converted into cancer cells, for example, with radiation or any kind of DNA damaging agent. But then your question is whether the cancer cells will make other healthy cells, if it will turn them into cancer cells. Is that your question? Yes. Does that happen? Yeah. It can, ha- it can actually happen. And this is beginning to unravel that they can be transfer of um, not metabolites, but, uh, but, uh, vesicles that contained information from the cancer cells to other normal cells, and they can 
convert them into cancer cells as well. It's possible. So what cancers that give off extracellular vesicles can literally co-opt other cells into becoming cancer cells? Yes. So in a way, that's like the extra extracellular vesicles act like viruses from the cancer cells to turn other cells into cancer cells. Yes, but that would be a sentence for the for the people to understand what is the function of the extracellular vesicles. It's it's because maybe we do not understand very well the function and the purpose of the extracellular vesicles. But yeah, in in order to to start from something, yes, you can say that it may act as a virus, the extracellular vesicle. Yeah, that's interesting. Have people tried to profile the extracellular vesicles given off by healthy cells versus cancer cells to see what the differences are? Yes, yes. This is also a very active part of research in which people, they the, uh, they try to identify and, and uh, characterize the extracellular vesicle proteome and, and, uh, and content. Uh, it's a little bit technically challenging because of the size of the extracellular vesicles and how you, can you distinguish extracellular vesicle from cell debris? But it is, uh, it is also uh, very actively pursued to catalog and understand what is the content and the purpose of the extracellular vesicles coming from cancer cells, for example, and what do they contain that they coerce normal healthy tissue to become cancerous or uh, sacrifice itself for the need of the cancer. So is there, does there appear to be coordination and communication from a primary tumor to metastases? Like, is the primary the boss? Or is there at least just communication between different sites of cancer in the body? There seems to be a type of communication, and extracellular vesicles seem to be one means of the communication material. Okay, but the, the context of the communication is not known, and no one knows, like, is there a one, you know, is there a boss tumor, or again, they just all coordinate? It's not known. One means is the probably the extracellular vesicles. The other one is the stress response induced by the cancer, so it is possible that some cancers may mediate uh, communication to another uh, cancer which is, has metastasized to the body by inducing a so-called stress response. And then that stress response will release uh, metabolites uh, in the uh, nerve endings near the tumor. And this is will have an effect on the tumor metabolism that may even grow or move even further. Do you know anyone that's created um, tumor organoids from someone's tumor? And try to culture them in a lab and grow them and see what what happens to their tumors. Oh yeah, of course there are many people doing that. They can, you can do it. You can do it in two uh, D cultures or three D spheroids, mm. or you you can uh, actually implant uh, human tumors into animals and and have them the so called xenografts. There are right. many um, laboratory protocols for for studying what you just mentioned. Well, what have you read has been noticed when people try to make tumor organoids? What do they do with them? What are they trying to figure out? Well, w- one thing that they try to figure out is that uh, if, you, if you study cancer in uh, monolayer cultures, we almost always see that it doesn't behave the same way in vivo. And one of the possible causes is the SATO architecture. So when you have it in two dimension, it's not working the same way as you have it in three dimension. One is because you have uh, different partial pressure of oxygen, gases, metabolite transfer, uh, interaction of of cell-to-cell, interaction of cell-to-extracellular matrix, and so on. So people try to imitate the tumor mass and tumor environment as much as possible by forming these spheroids in culture or by studying the tumor ex vivo in a xenograft in an animal. And there are really huge differences. Yeah, what are some of the differences? You said single-cell... Yeah, cancer in a dish, it doesn't act the same as a spheroid. What are some of the differences? And for example, the uh, a major, major difference between uh, uh, cancer uh, uh, growing in a dish in a two-dimensional culture is that those tissues, those cancer cells use, for example, their mitochondria for oxidative phosphorylation. I think uh, almost no solid tumor is doing this in, in vivo. So this is, this is a major a major finding. And I know people, for example, that they study the uh, metabolism of the tumor mass in vivo and they see an inverse relationship, for example, with oxidative phosphorylation and aggressivity and aggressiveness. So the more aggressive a cancer cell is, the less likely it's going to use oxidative phosphorylation. And oxidative phosphorylation is one of the major things in, in bioenergetics, in metabolism. And practically almost every tumor cell in 2D culture 
will use oxidative phosphorylation, but none of the cells that matter in the tissue use oxidative phosphorylation. It's a, it's a, it's a major difference. It's another okay. way of saying that we are wasting our time uh, studying 2D cultures. That makes sense, yeah. Has anyone taken a, um, you know, a spheroid cancer organoid and tried to infect it with a virus you know, that uh, commonly would kill that cell type and to see if um, the tumor is able to defend itself better because it's more heterogeneous? Well, uh, yes, these experiments are being done and... Uh, and uh, some, there are some viruses which are branded as oncolytic viruses, and these are known to exist in some animals, and they try to apply this knowledge also for some uh, uh, human tumors. If they can be uh, more prone to infection to specific viruses, whether native or genetically manipulated, or even bacteria or fungi, that would, that would make the tumor to be visible again to the host immune system, and then it will be more attackable, more visible. Because now you can say that it evades the radar. It's not really seen. And the, 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 the function of the, of the virus or the bacterium or the fungi would be to, to create a, an inflammatory response against the virus, but that would wake up the immunological system and see the tumor as well. Oh, okay. I see. So it serves two purposes. One is to attack the tumor, hopefully preferentially, but the other is to wake up the immune system to attack it. Right. What do you call it when you... I guess when you when you get the immune system going to attack the tumor, is there what's the name for that, or is there? It's a tumor inflammatory response. Okay, I just didn't know if it had a different name. But, uh, no, no. What about? I'm sure a lot of people are studying after chemo. How does it change tumors? So if I had um, if I did a biopsy on someone on their tumor, and then they got chemotherapy, and then I did another biopsy on their tumor, and I cultured like two, you know organoids, spheroids from them. What would these two tumors look like? How would they be different, do you think? But if the tumor, the second tumor came after the chemotherapy, then it would look very different. And this is a very well-known problem in certain uh, cancers, for example, in breast cancer. Uh, you have the primary tumor and uh, it has uh, no mutations in the, in the BRCA gene, BRCA gene one or two. And then these are responsive to certain chemotherapeutic agents. And then you give to the patient and the patient is doing very well. And then after one or two years, the patient relapses and he comes up with a tumor and that tumor does not respond to the chemotherapy regime. And then you sequence the tumor and you found that the tumor doesn't use these uh, genes anymore for which the uh, chemotherapy was addressed. So, so the tumor learned that you are using a weapon and now it made something to be, to be um, uh, immune to that weapon. And, uh, and how, does it, how does the tumor does this? It's just amazing. It's just unbelievable. It's not a mistake. It's not, a, it's not an error. It's not some kind of dysfunction. It's this, this ability to um, uh, adapt to the chemotherapeutic agent. It's, it's unknown to human tissue, to healthy tissue. You can almost say that cancer is an evolution. Yeah, <laughs> it, is well, it appears to be a deliberate adaptation instead of uh, just a mistake, you know. Yeah. And this, this kind of dysregulation of, meta, of metabolism, dysregulation of uh, checkpoints is not dysregulation. They, they're extremely active and well, um, active, well-regulated mechanisms to evade all that. There is nothing, there is nothing dysregulation about it. Um, if you were to, uh, I don't know if this has been done, but if someone, you know, again, has uh, metastatic cancer, has anyone tried to sample the primary versus some metastatic, metastatic sites or if they've been resected, you know, multiple sites and compare the difference? And if Whenever so, what's it, been observed? Yes, of course. This has been, this has been addressed uh, for decades now, the difference between the primary site and metastatic site. And this has been addressed from the uh, macropathological, micropathological or genetic point of view, pr uh, proteome, phosphoproteome. Um, we, do we do find a lot of differences. What we lack is the understanding what do they mean, if they are causal or consequential. So we don't know. And what, what, what characterizes the difference between primary and metastases? Typically, we, the metastases are more aggressive, or what else is uh, what's we observed? Know, yeah, we, we know that there are differences, but we do not know if they are causal or consequential. That's a, that's a very big problem with, mm. with cancer. Yeah, I would think that... Um, so. I would think metastases would have a much harder time and look very different than primaries. A big reason would be the microenvironment would be so different and it'd be much more foreign. You know, if there's like, again, liver cancer, at least it's liver cells around liver cells, even though they're different, but 
If it metastasizes to the lung, let's say, now you have liver cells amidst lung cells. It's a very different environment. Yeah, so I think right. that you would have to act very differently in order to survive. Yeah, you're right about that. But I think those cells that metastasize are the strongest to begin with. They are the ones uh, who are more likely to adapt into, into more challenging conditions. They are the ones that broke off from the primary sites. Yeah, I just wonder, you know, again, how they deal with that different microenvironments and are they more likely to surface and be visible to the immune system or same likelihood or less likelihood? Uh, the metastatic cells are more evading in their, um, they, are, they are more be- capable on, of for invading uh, the immunological response. So they are more blank, let's say, than, than the primary site. Oh, really? Yes, yes. The metastatic cells are always worse than the primary sites. Okay. Uh, what about cancers that are caused by viruses? Do you know much about them, like HPV or hepatitis C? And- yeah, so yeah, these are well understood uh, uh, viruses and tumors, preventable. And uh, I think it's uh, part of the public effort to eradicate uh, uh, tumors caused by transmissible viruses like the HPV and the, and the hepatitis C. So yeah, this, they, they don't differ much from the overall uh, tumor metabolism or immunologic or, or, or checkpoint and so on. But they do differ from the point of view that it is something preventable because uh, more, many from the other tumors, of course, other than, let's say, lung cancer caused by smoking, uh, they are not, uh, they are not the, the, the causes are not so well identified. Here you have uh, a, a very well identifiable cause for causing the tumor. Yeah, how do you think cancer first starts? Do you, you know, some people say, oh, it's just random mutation. Could it be a continuous adaptation to stress, which becomes a maladaptation? Like, how do you think cancer first starts? Yeah, so uh, a bit of both, but let me tell you one one finding which which uh, lends credibility to the latter, which is like a, a long term stress. So they have taken, I think, I think this research was done in the fifties or sixties. So they have taken uh, rat cardiomyocyte. The cardiomyocyte is a cell that never becomes tumor. It's a post-mitot- almost a post-mitotic cell, so it, it, you never have heart tumors, okay? And what they did is that they took uh, rat cardiomyocytes in culture, and they were uh, culturing them for uh, several years under stressful conditions. Uh, the stressful conditions, those usually um, involved in um, tumorigenesis. And after several years, the cardiomyocytes, they turned uh, into cancer cells. So that uh, attests to the f- to the fact that uh, it can really be that a long stress may cause a cell to subsume, let's say, and convert it into a cancer cell. On the other hand, you have other kind of uh, incidences like like uh, radio mutagenesis or chemical mutagenesis. The air that we breathe, the stuff that we eat, the water that we drink, they all contain mutagenic agents, and and they they uh, lead to um, cancer one day to another. And a very classical example is the amount of radon gas which is coming out from the from the soil. So depending on which city do you live in, uh, how much radon gas is coming out uh, from the soil, that is actually highly uh, correlated with the with the amount of um, uh, cancer incidence in that particular city. And uh, these uh, cancer incidences, you can see them very well in the so-called uh, uh, clusters of death. This is where this is very well studied in the United States. You have certain areas which are labeled as clusters of death because of the very high incidence of cancers, particular cancers, and they are not only they are not only attributed to poverty or smoking or alcoholism or crime or or but they they can be due to the quality of food, quality of water, quality of air, amount of radon gas produced in the particular vicinity. If you look, for example, at the Mississippi River, the whole Mississippi River. Those people who live there, they are sitting on a cluster of death. And what does that are, mean, a cluster of death? What, what do you mean? A cluster of death is that you take the, uh, a country, then you take the national average of cancer incidents. Okay? Let's say that you have, I don't know, 20 deaths per I don't know, 100. Okay? And okay. That's the national average. And then, and then you go by area and you say, okay, in this district, in Mississippi, for example, it's 40 or 50. And then you go to Nevada and you say it's 10. So those which are 25% above the national average and how many times above, that is a cluster of death. I, I see what you mean, right? In terms of liquid biopsies, have you observed that they're, uh, they're coming onto the market? Um, are they far away? You know, what's the state of the art there? 
Yeah, this is this is the next best thing, the liquid biopsy. Um, I do not know how much will it work, but it would it would be really nice if it if it will work out. It is in it, it is in its infancy, but it's very highly promising, and uh, I like it uh, from two aspects. One is the very early detection, and this, if it can happen, let's say you can have it as a checkup every I don't know few months or so. You don't have to uh, subject the patient to uh, biopsies or whole scans and so on. Well, liquid biopsy, yeah. What, what are what are some of the biomarkers? Are you familiar with any of them that they look for in a liquid biopsy? The biomarkers, okay. So the, people are focusing now on uh, DNA and RNA on the biomarkers, but I think greater promise are those which rely on lipids in the blood. And no matter how ridiculous it may sound, uh, you you may have heard of stories, for example, that dogs may smell in the breath. Uh, Cancer. And there is some, there's a little bit of truth in that. Now, what is what the dog smell or the animal smell is is uh, uh, lipids, okay, fats. It's not DNA. I and uh, and if you look at the so, for example, the eye knife. The eye knife is a is an invention in which uh, it is a electrocauterizing knife during uh, the cancer resection. That that uh, as soon as it burns the 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 tissue, and if it is tumorous, then it proceeds cutting. Then if it or if it cuts through a healthy tissue. The particular fats which are burned, they give a, a type of smell which are immediately detected by a, by a machine. And uh, the, the, um, the, the point I want to make is that the lipid composition has a lot to tell regarding the difference between the tumor and the healthy tissue. And this may be sought off also in the liquid biopsy, not just the DNA and the RNA. So what, people that have cancer may produce different lipids or different concentrations of lipids? Uh, their tissue, their t- tumor tissue, definitely, yes. And I think there will be also differences found in the lipid composition in the circulating blood. And uh, there is a lot to be learned and understood in the lipid. For example, for proteins, we have, let's say, approximately 20 amino acids, and we have several thousands of proteins. But to compare it with the lipids, for example, people say about, I don't know, cardiolipin, but cardiolipin is actually a subset of lipids consisting of 6,000 subspecies. And that goes for many, many lipids. So if it is to, to amass, the types of, of lipids that we have in our body may come into millions compared to a few thousand that we have for the proteins. There is yeah. much greater diversity, yes. So I guess when it comes to cancer, heterogeneity is the name of the game, but that's what makes it so difficult to understand and fight. One of it, yes, one aspect, a very important aspect, yes. Okay. Well, so, you know, we just have a few minutes left. What what do you see as uh, some promising treatments or understanding breakthroughs that are coming soon? Are we uh, close metab- to anything? Yeah, metabolic therapy of cancer. I believe in that. So we don't okay. really need to understand the, uh, the, the heterogeneity so much in order to fight it. But what we do understand is that tumors uh, exhibit different metabolism than the healthy tissue. And if you understand those differences, then it's enough to address uh, tumor from the metabolic point of view cut off the energy of the meta- of the tumor. Is it possible to do that without cutting off the energy to, you know, normal cells? I think it's possible, yes. And is this because of the fermentation versus oxy- oxidative phosphorylation or what other methods? In, in a very crude way of saying, yes, that's one major difference. It's not sufficient, but it's a very important difference. Well, what, what are some of the other major ways that people are working on to uh, to try to do this, to selectively get rid of the cancer? Well, one is the particular need of metabolites for the cancer, for example, for serine or prote- of proline or arginine. So, of course, uh, normal human healthy cells also require these metabolites, but not all at the same time. So if you were able to very briefly block the provision of these metabolites to the tumor or to the vessels that supply the tumor, the tumor won't be able to survive. You may, you may have some stress of the healthy tissue as well, yes, but uh, they are not so dependent on it, not as much as the tumor. Yeah, Christos, um, to, to end with this, tell me about the focus of your research a little bit, and then I want to ask how people can find you and find out more about you. Okay, so our uh, uh, focus of interest is the um, identifying the uh, metabolic pathways which are pertinent to the tumor versus normal healthy tissue cells, because we believe that if you if you know what are the bioenergetic pathways used by the tumor, but not by the healthy tissue cells. These form the primary pathways for chemotherapeutic intervention. This is in a nutshell. And uh, if the people would like to find me, then uh, I'm the project manager of the RPPA facility of the Semmelweis University in Budapest, Hungary. 
Well, very good. Christos, thanks for coming back. I really appreciate it. You have a lot of knowledge. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you for inviting me. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.